Right, uh, <clears throat> we are sitting down today with the man of the moment, uh, Leo Prinsler himself. Leo, welcome here. Thank you very much. We have decided to have this talk um, regarding this incident that has now gone viral all over the world. Uh, just to shed some light on it and get Leo's perspective on this and, and, and obviously get the correct message out there. The one without the sensation, the one without um, all the tales, uh, the one from without all the keyboard wires and hear from the man himself what went down that day and also a bit more behind this. So uh, let's say something like Leo Unplugged. So Leo, your version, what, what would be your opening statement? What would you like to say to start this, this conversation? Thanks, Dion, um, for the opportunity. Um, you know, this thing has been really crazy. It's something that we never anticipated to happen. Um, if everything went right, it shouldn't have happened. The video shouldn't have came out in the first place. But now it did, and it's all over. Um, everybody, you know, all over makes me the hero. Um, it's been an on and off thing for me to do that type of um, operational deployment. I'm more in the, in the training line of things, but from time to time I do it. The real heroes out there is the, is the brave warriors of cash and transit, um, companies, armed reaction, policemen that that runs to these type of situations on a daily basis um, you know they fight one day the next day they need to go back and those are the real heroes in the in the biggest scheme of things my situation um, maybe highlighted the, the the issue and the you know the, the the crime pattern and problems that we are facing in South Africa and maybe it's an opportunity to, to highlight it to the world and to um, people that's not familiar with what is happening. But um, myself um, and Lloyd did what we had to do. We were tasked to um, you know, escort that valuable asset career vehicle. And like many other um, companies and CIT robberies and CIT uh, protection teams, they get under fire. It happens weekly, almost daily. There is battles being fought on the streets of South Africa where hundreds of rounds are being fired in a single incident. And you can't you can't refer to it as an incident, it's a war. You know, if you if there's 250 to 300 rounds being fired per robbery, it's not an incident, it's downright a war zone. And sometimes it there's two good guys versus 20, 30 bad guys. Sometimes they, they, they manage to, to survive, sometimes they don't. A couple of weeks ago, a week after my incident, there was another guy that did the same, same um, task. He was unfortunately, he was killed. Um, but that, you know, the unfortunate thing is that doesn't reach the, the media. Mm. And that's the sad part that, that's from this um, whole incident, you know, they, there's a big hype about one incident and all the others just go by the wayside and never never gets out there. And people think this is an isolated incident, which it's absolutely not. To me that's that's the that's one of the things that I found. All these news agencies we've been talking to over this past week. Everybody asked me this one question. How often does this happen in South Africa? And I don't think that the public actually realizes the gravity of the situation that we are in. They don't realize what you just said, the war that we're fighting. Um, they don't understand how often these things actually happen. Um, the scary part for me is that this, the most of the, well, a lot of South African people don't get this. They were like, what the hell is going on? Um, is this really happening? Yeah, oh. yeah true. You see, the thing is, we are. I think we've become so desensitized with crime in general. Um, you know, if it's not cash in transit, it's a hijacking. If it's not hijacking, it is um, business robberies, house invasions, rape, murder, of all kinds of things like that. 
I think South Africans have um, been bombarded so much with, with the bad stuff in the, in the last couple of years that we try to you know, just put it under, under a blanket and not, not face the reality. But these kinds of things happen literally on a daily basis. Between my incident and as we sit here today, I know about six robberies that take place or took place and where, where people get um, injured, wounded, um, killed. Um, so it's, it's a severe problem out there which needs to be, needs to be addressed. Not only for the, for the security part, um, you know, people themselves, but public in general. Yeah. Because it, it affects absolutely everybody. I think there's the key. It affects everybody. So we'll get to that yeah, in a bit. Sadio, I think uh, if you wouldn't mind describing in your own words what went down that day on the video. Okay. So, you know, it turned out to be a normal day. Um, we, we started escorting the vehicle, ending up on the highways. As normally, um, one tried to keep a very good observation around the vehicle as far as you can, as best as you can. Um, I thought I, I, could, I would be able to spot them um, before they knock us. But unfortunately, the first moment that I knew they were there was when the shots hit. Um, struck the vehicle. Um, the one vehicle came past us um, before the shots were being fired because they use usually two or three vehicles or more in certain cases. One vehicle is dedicated to the courier van um, and then there's one or two vehicles dedicated to the escort vehicle because they know that the, if they take out the escort um, vehicle and you know the security of the merchandise you know the, the stealing of the um, you know the robbery of the merchandise is a um, you know is easy easy target. So the the bucket got past us, and the next thing I heard was the gunshots. I had a look in my mirror. Um, I saw where they were. They were on my four five o'clock area. I swerved into them. And one needs to understand these guys didn't wake up that morning and decided to do a, a robbery. These guys are organized, they've got training, um, they are, like we all know, they are either current or ex-police, military or security personnel. They are trained, they have got contacts, they um, know what they are doing. Military precision is evident on a lot of these um, incidents. So I tried to, to bump them off the road, they managed to, I managed to miss them first time, and then I saw the bucky pushed the, the courier van off. Then I went over, um, went for them, trying to, to get them away from the courier van. As I drove past them, the, the bucky took off. I tried to ram him off. Um, and he just disappeared. The, the other vehicle came from behind. Um, again, I tried to, to block him. He came past me, I tried to, to, to ram him again. Unfortunately, those vehicles are quite um, you know, powerful and fast. So he got past me before I could give him a proper, proper push. Once he went past me, I turned around to go back to the crew vehicle um, to see where the air crew was. Um, I knew they were out of the bucky. They ran down the highway. Um, but at that stage, there were three armed um, robbers with AKs on the, on the highway. So I went back to the crew van. As I got to it and I looked back, the, the Audi turned around and he parked and broadsided into the, um, into the highway and his crew came out, they formed an extended line and they started shooting us at us again. So I went for them again with my vehicle and you know, I know some of the, the questions was why didn't we shoot back and all of that. That particular vehicle didn't have any um, gun ports um, in the doors or um, windows, so that wasn't a great option. I had, I would have had to open the door to engage him with a rifle. Um, at that stage, my vehicle was my weapon and my my cover, so that was my first option um, to use until it's exhausted, until the vehicle has been shot out or disabled completely. 
then my follow-up um, you know, actions would have changed. But at that stage, that, that was my first option and that's what we, that, that's what we used. So um, I went after the audio again. At that stage, there were six armed men on the, on the highway. I tried to chase the audio down. He went into um, you know, entrance of a hotel close by. I pushed him around. He went over, the, over those concrete walls. He got stuck. I tried to get, get over the concrete walls to get close to him. And I got stuck. And unfortunately, that's where the whole thing ended. Um, so that's, that's how that incident happened. The, the severity of the gunshots, or you know, the the accuracy of the gunshots, is evident that it was not a first-time um, robber or a untrained person behind those AKs and the other weapons that they've used. You can see they were um, well well prepared. The modus operandi is is what they normally use. We know that, um, and that was my my. My go-to, my go-to plan. The only thing you can really do in a situation like that is try to pre-visualize what you're going to do. There's unfortunately no ways that any person, any training provider can can train you specifically in a real-life scenario like that to do. So in my mind, I knew my weapon was my vehicle, and that is how I was going to um, utilize it. And I kept on pre-visualizing what I will do, and luckily um, that kicked in. Um, it was an instinctive action. In a situation like that, one cannot formulate plans once the shots is incoming and once the once everything starts happening. Then you are a lot of your actions is based on instinctive actions, and those instinctive actions are based from previous experience and training. And you know concepts, what we call muscle memory, that needs to be built, and all of that starts in your mind. Um, you need to have a, you need to have a strong mind. You need to have a clear mind as to what your um, weapons are. You need to be instinctively familiar with your tools and systems that you has to your um, availability. Let's talk about some of the talking points out there. Um, the first one being, <clears throat> okay, you covered why didn't you shoot back? Because that's one of the issues that I see all over. Why didn't they shoot back? Okay, so that one we've covered. The next one, uh, what could Lloyd have done any different? <laughs> yeah. hold, hold the gun better. Yeah. <laughs> Look, yeah, um, whenever you see, you know, all these incidents, you know, and with CCTV footages and cameras all over the world, we see them more and more, um, dash cams of police vehicles, shopping centers and things like that. And every second armchair critic and keyboard warrior has got his own version of what he would have would have done. Um, we take it from where it comes, we just laugh and laugh at them. You know, the some of the comments are really funny actually. Um, but you know, those people that has got lots of critics um, or criticism against Lloyd, you know, they must get up, put their sugar free um, soft drink down, put their bucket of popcorn down, get up from behind their screen or the TV where they watch the 100th you know, action movie, put on the bulletproof, put on your boots. Get into the car with us um, in that confined space, you know, and maybe when you're lucky, because you know you are bound to be lucky sometimes, um, you know, bullets will be incoming. Yeah. And let's see what you are made of, really, because hindsight is a wonderful thing. Yeah. And I, in hindsight, I could have done much better. I could have done certain things better. But in the moment, things happens in the moment, and you need to live in that moment, and you need to react in the moment. So, um, yeah, Lloyd did a, did a good job. He did what he was asked to do. Um, I asked him to phone Robbie and Joss, uh, <laughs> by name that are very famous now. 
Um, unfortunately, there was um, scramblers and cell phone scramblers and blockers and all those type of things. And that's, those type of equipment is available to the, to the bad guys. So he couldn't make the call. Um, what else should he have done? You know, like you said, he must, should he have held the gun better? Um, there was no opportunity for him to get out, run, shoot, or do anything. The best thing he could do was stay calm, which he did brilliantly. He didn't freak out um, and be a bigger, bigger um, burden on me, yeah, yeah. trying to keep the car on its wheels. So, you know, for a guy that worked fourth day in the company <laughs> and the, you know, on the fourth day, or well, first week in the company, fourth day in the gun battle, he did exceptionally well. Hats off to him. I think so too. Okay, Leo, another question that came up was why use the cell phone? Why not use the radios? I'm getting quotes for radios from all over the world. <laughs> um, you know, the, there's a place for radios in, in a lot of um, circumstances or incidents and work, work environments. In this case, it wouldn't have helped us because the, we were alone. We didn't have a backup. Um, if you have backup in close proximity, radios is absolutely the, the, the thing to have. Um, Robbie and Joss was in the area, but not in radio contact or in the reach of radio contact. And so making a call um, on a cell phone would have been the better option. We know that we are alone in a situation. You know, if there is a Good Samaritan maybe of another company or you know just happens to drive past or a policeman or whoever who's willing to assist you know that's an absolute bonus usually these um, robbers you know they are so brazen that they don't care about you know backup anyway they will also get get engaged so question of radios um, radios in this instance wouldn't have assisted us in any way to call for backup because backup was only 30 minutes away um, from the closest um, you know, point. Yeah. Okay, so I think let's move on to the next part of this um, training. Okay, so one of the solutions that we've talked about previously is um, training. Uh, so let's look at, let's say, industry specific training. What, uh, what is available there? What what do you what is your suggestions around training? Uh, what courses are there, and so on and so forth. Look, I'm I'm a trainer by art. Um, that's my passion. So training is the only thing that an operator has got to fall back on in an incident like that. Um, the better the training, the better chance he has got. The people normally there's a misconception, you know, they, they've got a firearm with him, he's got an armored vehicle, or he's got an IFAC, um, you know, medical kit on him, and he think he's he's ready to take, to take on the job and multiple attackers and you know manage the situation. And many times they fail because again one of the big, big misconceptions is that in the industry for a civilian and or security officer, there's a process that he needs to go through to, to obtain a competency certificate from the SA police. And many times I think that having by having that certificate in his hands, it makes him capable of managing the situation. That whole process is, is wrongly named. It should have been a compliance process instead of a competency process because it makes you compliant with the law, but not yet competent, or not necess necessarily competent. Competency comes over a period of time, multiple times on the range, or in training. Um, and I think that's where, the, where lots of people, um, the security industry as well, they are being regulated by, by PSIRA, um, by the police, and there's regulations that they need to adhere to. Unfortunately, there's companies out there that um, literally throws their people to the wolves. Um, you know, they appoint them with a bare minimum of qualifications, knowing that 
you know, the, 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 the environment that they're going to work in is so dangerous that because they uh, chase um, you know, money profit, yeah. and profit, the, the guy that he sends out into those jobs is just a collateral damage, almost kind of so. And that's, that's a big, big issue. I've been in the industry for many, many years. I've seen the, the level of training and the level of ability of, of armed security officers from all, in every field, be this cash and transit, armed reaction. And I'm very sad to say that the, that the quality and the ability out there does not stand up to the, to the dangers they are facing. The problem is now that the outcome of a situation like that is based on luck. Um, the, the operator is just lucky that he hasn't been killed and that is just not good, a good place to be. The industry needs to realize that uh, the better trained officer you get, the better jobs you will get. You know, they, then you, you, the, the guy on the street will sell himself or sell the company. He needs to look the part and he needs to be the part at the end of the day. Yep. Um, you know, you can, I've seen companies that really doesn't care. They've sent, they, they um, sent the guy maybe once a year for a, uh, a qualifying shoot or a, what we call a Regulation 21 assessment which is not even closely enough to get the guy where he needs to be to be able to manage himself. Um, but when it comes to bottom line margins, um, they, they do not want to spend money on their personnel. Mm. You know, that goes for, apart from training, you know, it goes to equipment and everything that goes with it. But when it comes to specific training, the people need to, to be able to have the confidence to go out there and know whatever comes his way, he will be able to, to, be able to manage. Mm. Too many times I get onto the range and I ask them, if you look at an incident like that, are you, how, how, many, how much confidence have you got to, to manage that? And sadly, almost 90% plus of them recognizes the fact that they do not have what it takes to, to do that. So to them, it's a job. He needs to earn an income um, and knowingly going into a potential gunfight every single day and still do it, still put on the bulletproof day after day. Um, you know, it's just amazing. Um, but you know, desperateness and you know, financial tough times cause calls for desperate measures at the end of the day. Yeah, well, I think definitely security companies need to start investing in their people and need to start upscaling them, because we are we are faced with a with a with a growing threat, as you said previously. These guys are trained; these guys come with intent. And just to just to maybe put that into perspective, people would ask me, "But why cell phones?" It is it's an easy it's easy maths, you know. You steal a hundred cell phones with ten thousand rand each. Okay, do that four times a week, yeah. do that four weeks a month. Crime actually pays in South Africa, that's the issue. Crime pays in South Africa and he buys guns and he buys drugs and he buys cars and he buys all these other kinds of things. And then in the industry we sit with that. So I think this message we need to get clear. We need to make, this, this must be very clear, that security companies need to invest in training in their personnel um, as a kickoff because they'll be able to, 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 to deliver a better service and so on and so forth. So on that point, what type of training is available from you guys for the industry? So we provide a wide variety of training. You know, um, firearm training entails a, a, wide, a wide array of, of courses. When we start training anybody, we need to start at the basics. We need to form a foundation that forms um, the base of, of anything he does with a firearm in his hand. Too many people out there think, you know, he, he watches one or two action movies and he can perform those same actions. It's very difficult to hit the target, you know, standing still. It's much difficult or um, 
much more difficult to hit it when, when you're under stress. There's moving targets, there's multiple targets, and there's incoming bullets. That changes the, the picture dramatically. So we do firearm training from a basic level to advanced tactical level. In all types of firearms there is. Um, we try to get the people's mindset ready because like I said, you know, that's that's what you've got. You've got a mindset, you've got a uh, a strong strong internal belief in yourself, and then you need to take that over into your physical actions. So we work on the mindset, we work on the physical and operational skills, and that's just on firearms. Then, well in my case, you need to be able to manage your vehicle. Yeah. In many cases, in many instances, the, the vehicle is the primary weapon for, the, for a period of time until you get shot out, which happens in a lot of um, the cases. And then you need to revert back to plan B and C and so forth as the environment changes because every gunfight is an extremely dynamic situation and it changes very rapidly and you need to be able to keep up with that changes very quickly so you need to be able to manage your vehicle you need to know the ability of your vehicle what you can do with your vehicle not to, to throw it over and then you put yourself back um, in the in the in the in the gunfight so to speak if you get hurt, you need to be able to apply medical assistance either to yourself or to your to your crew or to some other people. So we do um, TACMED courses where we teach the people how to um, self-help himself, stop the bleed, all, all those type of things, and to assist um, with immediate trauma um, wounds at, at a basic level, basically. So. Um, we do CPO courses, you know, close protection officers, because they are just the same, you know, the target is just different. Their target is a human, other people target is the cash or the, the client is cash or cell phones or whatever the case might be. But the attack is, is basically the same. So they need to have to be able to adapt to their, their working environment and so does the cash and transit um, operator needs to work in his environment. And everybody out there that's in this type of um, work function needs to be able to apply his mind effectively in his in his operational um, capacity. So we we do all those type of courses. There's other companies that does it as well. Um, the thing is, um, companies and I've worked for some some companies that I found they they just want to adhere to the bare basic minimum training standard that's being set out and, and that is just absolutely not enough mm. to qualify the people for what they need to do. I think on that point what is important to understand, that's what this, this is my take on it, is that many people will send, either civilians will come on one course or a company will send the staff on one course and then they'll be, oh wow we learned this. But what people must understand is that the threat in South Africa is an ongoing threat. And as the time passes, the threat is growing and it's increasing and it's becoming worse and worse. So as the criminals become wise, uh, just so the rest of us need to. And I, I'm a very pro-advocate for continuous training, for coming back and doing the next level and the next level and the next level. And the next level. Yeah, continuous training is a is an absolute must do. Um, whether it's for the security industry, for civilians, there's no way that you can have a one day um, training session and it's going to prepare you for life for an, any any incident like this, or even remotely like this. Um, to build up a muscle memory, there needs to be time spent um, on the range. You, you, you need to adopt a mindset and a lifestyle of incorporating all these tactics and techniques and so forth into your system so that the, the execution of those tactics and skills and all that you've gained from training needs to be instinctively applied because there's a concept that we call the body alarm reaction and a lot of things um, happens to your mind and your body during a situation like that 
and your rational thought process is very severely hampered. Your hearing goes, goes south, you get tunnel vision. Um, all of those things um, is required to, to, to be effective, but it gets severely hampered during a stressful situation. And the only thing that you can really do to, 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 to give yourself a, a fighting chance, so to speak, is to, to train, to repeat, train and repeat, and to get all those actions as an absolute muscle memory, to get your correct instinctive actions just like, like a heartbeat. Um, a once off training is all good and well. We see it a lot, unfortunately. People are very excited after a basic shoot sometimes, and you know they will see us again and again and again. But there's a very, very small percentage of people that comes back for continuous training. And then some of on, on our basic shoots, you will see old shooters that comes. Um, they are very good shooters, uh, and they will come for a basic shoot because they know and understand what it what it requires. You need to have a basic foundation and upon that you build up all your your special skills if you want to call it that. Um, but continuous training is if you if you value your life and if you value your ability to to, to um, make a stand and you know to protect your family, to protect your crew, whatever, then continuous training is an absolute must. Okay, so uh, I think we've heard the story now um, and I just want to sort of emphasize the importance of training uh, for both the security industry, farmers, uh, community policing and normal civilians out there. Um, if by now you don't get the severance of what's actually happening out there, the reality of crime in South Africa, then you're most probably not watching anything out on social media or news at all. So you've heard how important training is, you've heard how important continuous training is, and obviously you should now begin to understand how important the correct training is. So it's important to get in touch with us so that we can um, you know, tell you more about the courses and the specific courses, keeping in mind that we do tailor make courses uh, we do client-specific courses, um, as Leo have mentioned, the CPO courses, advanced driving courses, there's the long lo loan operator course running over a 12-month period, there's the basic shoots, the competency shoots, the sniper courses, and so on and so forth. Um, keep, an, keep an eye on the pages, we'll have the links on the video, we'll have the links, I'm not sure if we'll have it on the top here or the bottom or on the <laughs> side, we can just have a look in the descriptions and wherever and keep following us um, for news on that. So Leo, I just want to thank you for your time and hopefully we got the message out now and we can carry on with life as it is. Yeah. Last words from you. Uh, thanks Dion for the opportunity. Yes, um, from my side, um, yeah, that's what we do. We try to, to give a person a fighting chance out there. Um, you know, I've been overwhelmed with support from all kinds of social media platforms. Um, it's really been a, a humbling time in my life. We, from across the world, people has um, contacted us, um, sending us well wishes and all of that. We cannot, it's impossible for us to, to, to answer everything and every single one of them. Um, to everybody out there, thanks a lot. It really means a lot to us. Um, and, you know, stay safe, watch your six. And, um, yeah, look after yourselves. All the CIT guys, this one's for you. Yeah.